If you have a Bible with you, please turn to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. We are going to read the second of Paul's great prayers that are recorded for us in this letter. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 3. We begin reading at verse 14 and we'll go through to the end of the chapter. For this reason, Paul writes, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length, the height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray, shall we? <clears throat> our Father, tonight we meet deeply aware of our great need for your power within us to shake off the lethargy and the unbelief of the world that often clings to us like birds do to our skin. Will you not come and through your word tonight give us a fresh vision of what you are able to do in us and through us? We have sung, blessed spirit of the living God, of your wonderful work within us. And we pray that tonight we would be given faith to see things invisible. That Christ might become the more precious, the more near, the more real and the more vital in our daily living. And so may we, as your people, come alive with fresh life and may that life manifest itself in the love that leads to the unity that causes the world to believe that you have been sent by the Father. So help us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I think that this little passage we've read together is really tailor-made for our focus tonight upon renewal and revival. Number one, it is a prayer, and it offers us guidelines that help shape how we ought to pray. Secondly, it's a prayer for Christians. And even though when we think of revival and renewal, we think of people flooding into the church, and we long to see that, Yet, nevertheless, renewal and revival ordinarily begins with the people of God. And that's the third thing that this passage deals with. It, it speaks of an, an, a prayer for an enlarged experience of the reality of Christ. And that's desperately what we need. And it's very much what lies at the heart of revival and renewal. His words flow out of what Paul has written in the earlier two chapters. He's begun with a doxology, a paean of praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ in the heavenly places. And then he goes on to pray that the uh, readers, uh, that includes us as well, might have the spirit of wisdom and revelation that we might see these things more clearly particularly the hope of our calling and the wonder of God's inheritance in his saints, and then thirdly, of the greatness of his power toward us, which is like the power that he exercised in raising Christ from the dead and placing him at his right hand. Then he goes on to say, in effect, you know, that power has already been at work in everybody who is a believer because we were once dead in transgressions and sins, and God made us alive together with Christ, purely out of grace, and seated us with him in the heavenly places. 
And flowing on from that, he highlights the fact that this is true both for Jew and for Gentile. Christ is peace for both Jew and Gentile. He has brought those who were once strangers to God into the household and commonwealth of Israel. And now, built on the foundation of the prophets and the apostles, they are a holy dwelling place of God through the Spirit. So that's what, what he's been talking about. And it shouldn't surprise us, in the light of how central Christ is to all of these great blessings, that in this prayer, he should pray that the Spirit who does dwell in the church would work powerfully within the church to lead it not simply into an understanding of the riches of grace in Christ, but also into the experience of that. These verses have been described as the summit or the apex or the high point of experiential Christianity. For there can be nothing really more wonderful in the experience of God and grace, as we know it now, than to be filled with all the fullness of God. And that's where Paul, in this prayer, leads us. And in three great and wonderful steps, as it were, we scale this mountain and, by the grace of God, reach that point of where we truly are amazingly blessed to know the life of God himself. And that's what happens in revivals. When God is at work, God is in the midst of his people, but God is also powerfully at work within his people. And that's what we need to pray for as we gather here tonight. Well, let's look firstly at an indispensable requirement for the renewal and revival of the church. And that is a work of power from the Holy Spirit within the hearts of people. Now, Paul is here writing to believers. He's writing to those who, in the first chapter, he tells us, have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. They are indwelt individually and corporately in the church. It is a dwelling place of God through the Holy Spirit. So these people already have the Spirit, and what he's praying for is not for regeneration, and he's not praying for a second blessing or perhaps, as some might see it, a baptism or a sealing of the Holy Spirit. These people already have that. And yet he is working, he is praying here that God, out of the riches of his glory, and that idea of, of God being infinitely rich is something that Paul loves to appeal to. He speaks of the unsearchable riches of Christ. And here he's speaking of the riches of God's glory, and he's saying, out of that, will you not grant us, look at the words here, may he grant us to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. He is praying for a strengthening of the inner being of his people. Now, Paul uses that expression, inner being, you recall, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 or 4, 16 and following. He says, the outer man is, is wasting away, but he says the inner man is being renewed. And by that expression, he is referring to all that is in us that really constitutes the center and driving force and power of our being. Broadly speaking, the Bible recognizes an outer man and an inner man. And the inner man is that sight and scene of the interaction of our thoughts, feelings, desires, purposes. It's really what drives us and what makes us alive and active. And the Apostle Paul here is praying that God, through a work of power, by his Spirit, would strengthen now, how profoundly we need that, do we not? Think for a moment just of our minds and of how, when it comes to the things of God, easily distracted they are. When you come to pray, how, how readily thoughts of coffee that needs to be brewed or something you've forgotten or going to... Our minds flit, flit everywhere. And when we think of our affections... 
You know, often Stoic Reformed Presbyterians are thought to be people without feelings at all. That's, that's not the way it should be, and it's not the way it is when God works in his people. They're filled with joy. They're filled with sorrow. They're filled with passion for the lost. Our problem is not the, the, the overkill of affection. Our problem is the lack of the right kind of affections for the right causes and sources. And we, we desperately need the Holy Spirit to stir us up and to strengthen us in our, in our thoughts and our feelings and our desires and in our purposes and our resolve so that we're really... I, I once had the blessing of hosting a Welsh pastor, Graham Harrison from Newport. And perhaps I've told you this before. Forgive me if I have. But he and Howell Jones and another of other younger men sat under the ministry of Dr. Martin Lord Jones at Westminster Chapel. And, and he said, in those evenings after the evangelistic services, he said, we came out and we wanted to take on the world because of this gospel. Now, we need that. We need the Holy Spirit to be strengthening the inner man so that instead of weak, listless, and, and cold and dull, we are passionate people that believe profoundly, feel deeply, and determine strongly. We need to be those kinds of people. And how many influences there are in the world today that counter those things, aren't they? We, we live in a world full of distractions, a world that seduces our feelings and affections to things that probably should not be. I have to confess that one of my uh, dreams is sometime to go on a cruise around the islands, a boat cruise and so on. And when I see one of those big cruise liners, I think, oh, I wish I felt as strongly about my sin and about the need of the lost. We have many things that suck and siphon emotional energy and mental thinking. And we desperately need the Spirit of God to work within us, to stir up and strengthen the inner man. So that's what Paul is praying for. And that's where this work of revival begins, a work of the Holy Spirit upon our humanness in the depths of our thinking and our feeling and our being. Now, secondly, Notice how Paul leads us from this foundational need to a second stage, namely the goal. What's the purpose for this? Where does it lead? And the Apostle Paul says this, that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. Verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, this is the priceless. This is a special part. You may say, well, Jesus already lives in my heart. And that's profoundly true and wonderful. It is the mystery. Jesus himself told his disciples that he would come to them. He would not leave them orphans. And we know that such is the union between Christ and the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Jesus. And in Romans chapter 8, verses 9 and 10, the Apostle Paul can speak about the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus, and then Jesus in you. It's all of a mix. Because the in Jesus' resurrection and glorification, he, in a sense, is not only asking the Father, he doesn't only ask the Father for the Spirit, but in a sense, he possesses the Spirit. The Spirit possesses him. And the Spirit comes to us as the presence and person of Christ. And so if you have the Holy Spirit in you tonight, there's a very real sense in what Christ is in you. But that's not what Paul's talking about here quite. But he is talking about Christ dwelling in our hearts by faith. And I think, and I know this is a, 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 a it's difficult, I couldn't be perhaps dogmatic upon this, but my understanding of this is this. We may have the spirit of Jesus, we have made Jesus in us, but, but totally unconscious of it. Go through our days without knowing it. 
However, when the Spirit of God stirs up and strengthens in our hearts, when he sheds his light upon Christ, there is a very real conscious awareness through faith that Jesus is in me and in you. Let me give an example of this. Recently, I drove to the South Island, long journey, and one leg of that was quite brief. It was from Palmerston North down to... I uh, forgot the name of it. Uh, Otaki. Palmerston. No, not a very big journey. But that morning, I had been reflecting on the Great Commission. And the 18th verse struck me, as perhaps never before, when Jesus said, All power, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Go there. That, that wonderful, wonderful notion of the definitive gift of authority and power and position given to the glorified slain Jesus. And that thought filled my mind and heart for an hour and a half. I hardly knew I was driving. I shared this with somebody else later and says, I'm glad I wasn't on the road when you were there. Uh, I mention that because the Spirit, through his word, made Christ passionately real by faith in my heart and life and mind. And the natural response of that is to turn one's heart to him. One of my favorite sayings, I, I took it down from my pin board today because I've stripped my study naked as I'm going away, if I may say that. There's a statement by James Stewart, a Scottish preacher theologian. He may not quite be simply Ferguson, but anyway, he made this statement about Paul's spiritual life. And he said, for Paul, spiritual life involved the continuous appropriation of the real presence of Christ in the experiential life of the believer. Now, I like that. And that's what Paul's talking about here that the Holy Spirit would so grant the gift of faith that the unseen Christ might be to our consciousness, in our hearts, in our minds, in our affections, that he might be present and might be real to us. And that's a very wonderful thing. And again, a very needed thing. How many of us go through a day without a thought of Christ? without the awareness that he is fully present with us and that he invites and calls us for the continuous appropriation of his real presence through the power and life of the spirit and word that he's given to us. That's life. That, that, that's what life. And it doesn't matter where you are and what you're doing and what you're working. This is not something that compels your concentrated total thought but it does involve you receiving and delving into what you and your soul know to be true and real. Christ. Christ in me. Christ with me. And where does all this lead? Well, it leads to the third step in this journey. He says, verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, Wow, what a tremendous statement that is. Rooted, of course, is appealing to trees and to plants that have their roots deeply immersed in the soil from which they draw their nutrients. Here, rooted and grounded what? In, in love. In love. He says, that being rooted and grounded, up, you may have strength. This is what the Spirit does. He gives us strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. That's where it's lead. What, what a wonderful, what an interesting thing that the Apostle Paul says that rooted and grounded in love. It's not really surprising. Last night, as we met together to confess our sins, Logan se selected a, a song that uh, <laughs> is really one of my favorites. Listening to it again, it struck me how deeply moved. 
My Lord, what love is this that paid so dearly that I, the guilty one, might go free? And then the chorus, beautiful, amazing love. Oh, what sacrifice. The Son of God given for me. My debt he pays, and my, my death he dies, that I might live. Wow. That, last, last night as we sang that, I, it was that expression, the Son of God given for me. Wow. That is love. That is amazing love. And as the Holy Spirit strengthens us, and enables us to see Christ more clearly, we begin to see the height and the depth and the length and the breadth of that love. And some of the great commentators and Bible students have loved to look at that, the height of his love and the depth of his love that reaches so low, the breadth of his love, the length of it. Oh. All in this same third chapter speaks of the unsearchable riches of and above all, we see the unsearchable riches of his love. Who loved me, Paul wrote to the Galatians, and gave himself for me. The more deeply, personally, really, and intimately we know Christ, the more we're conscious of his love. And that's an amazing, amazing thing. Amazing love. And this is, we begin to know that love. It's not only comprehend it, but we know it and experience it. And it's a very wonderful thing. And he says, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. I will leave Logan to expound that to you some other time because it's got depths beyond, I think. But just listen to, filled, that you may be filled Pleroma is a word that Paul loves to use in letters to Ephesians and Colossians. And it has that notion of, of fullness. In, in, in writing to the Colossians, he's conscious that some of the errorists are talking about a fullness of religion through perhaps mystery religions or experience, ecstatic experiences or something. But he says, look, in Christ all the fullness of God is found. And in him you are complete. And in him, somehow we come to experience all the fullness of God. Our understanding of the Trinitarian life of God is one that centers on the idea of a perfect community that is eternally being in love. Ex giving of the, the one to the other, delighting in the other, receiving and appreciating. It is a community of love. And when Paul says this, comprehending and knowing Christ, that we too might be filled with a... Jonathan Edwards, that great revival preacher and theologian of the 18th century, wrote a little treatise called Heaven is a World of Love. And, and that's, that's what it is. And we, when the Spirit of God comes and works powerfully in us, begin to taste of that love. And that love promotes the unity. And that unity says to a world, this is a work of God. And they say, behold, how these Christians love one another. That's where Paul leads us here. Our deepest need is for that work of the Spirit to stir us up. Brothers and sisters, do not deny it. Freely acknowledge the distractedness, the coldness, the fleetingness. Of a, we must always begin by facing the reality of our poverty. And out of that, cry to God. And out of the riches of his grace and glory, he would strengthen us through his spirit. That Christ would dwell in our hearts through faith. And we would comprehend his love, but we would know that love also and so be filled with all the fullness of God. My last word is this. In the latter part of the 19th century, there was a movement in America that has come to be recognized by some anyway as revivalism. America had experienced God's wonderful grace 
in the 18th and 19th centuries, and firstly the first great awakening and the second awakening. And in the latter part of the 19th century, there were people looking at the profound effects of revival. It's, it's emotional effects and it's transforming effects. They began to say, if we create the conditions, we can produce revival. That was revivalism. And it gave birth to camp meetings, to the sawdust trail, to the penitence altar up the front, or penitence rail up the front. And it gave birth to a movement which Logan alluded to last night again in the church of today, which is so driven by emotion and emotionalism and is seeking to produce these effects of genuine spiritual revival externally. What Paul reminds us about here is revival comes about internally. And it comes about through the Spirit of God. And God will not be manipulated, but he will be sought and he will be asked. And that's what we need to do tonight, to ask for a work of the Spirit of God in this decadent generation awakening and aliving us as Christians and empowering us to go out unapologetically in the world, not only proclaiming Christ, but demonstrating the fullness of God as we experience it through his spirit. Let's pray together, shall we? We do humbly acknowledge, Father, that we are so often weak and cold. Here we have the scriptures that reveal to us the glory of our new life in Christ. And yet we often content ourselves with the meager and deceptive pickings of the world. Lord, will you not work within us? Will you not open our minds to see the glory and the wonder? Will you not awaken the tastes in our spirit and soul? that we would hunger and thirst for these things. And will you not empower us that we may go out and live radically different lives and proclaim unashamedly the glorious gospel of grace? We ask it in Jesus' name.